Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to another Foreman community. Uh, so this is the first time I'm hosting this demo, so I'm hoping we'll have an interesting demo, as we always have. And of course that everything will go as planned. And as usual, we want this demo to be as interactive as possible. So everyone demoing today is hoping to hear your feedback. Uh, so please feel free to write questions and comments to us. Uh, on the Libra at the Form and Dev chat. And you can also write here uh, on the YouTube live chat uh, as both will be monitored. So our first topic today will be entered by Jeremy and he's going to talk today about exporting content with Form and Ansible models. So I'm passing the mic to you, Jeremy. Uh, so Today I want to uh, I want to tell you about exporting content with Foreman Ansible modules. So you may be familiar with the, the current process for doing that. I think since the uh, Catello version 4.1 or something, we've had this available. Um, so the idea is if you have a completely disconnected air-gapped uh, Foreman server and you need to get content to it, uh, you want to sync it from a connected formant server to an air-gapped formant server, what you would do is uh, you would run this uh, hammer command, and uh, it would do a pulp uh, export for you, pulp3 export. It would put some tar gz files on the disk for you, and then there would also be a metadata JSON file that you need for import. You would take all those files, you would put them on your USB drive uh, or whatever, walk them over to your super secret data center, and then import them into the air-gapped uh, from a server. So what we have added right now is at adding support for that for uh, instead of Hammer, doing it with four minutesable modules. Uh, so I've got uh, a few sample playbooks that I've made here. Um, and then let me just show you one of them. So here's my um, playbook that I've written for exporting the library. Uh, you can export a library or a content view version or a repository. And uh, I'll, I'll show you all of those. But here's my library playbook. As you know, a playbook is a list of plays. And a play includes hosts to run the job on and then a list of tasks. So here's our play here. Um, so to export the library content, we use this Ansible module content export library. These first three parameters here, uh, I was just kind of lazy. I didn't make a separate variables file, so I, I repeat those here. But then these, these parameters here, organization, destination server, uh, and fail on missing content, those are uh, parameters that the Catello API takes when you, uh, and Hammer takes when you do a content export. So it, it just passes them through and does the export for you. Uh, and then I, I mentioned before that there is a metadata.json file that you need for import. And it, it was actually not Catello or Pulp that was putting that on the disk for you. That's, that's Hammer that actually does that. So uh, now that we've moved to form Ansible modules, we needed a solution to get that metadata.json file onto your disk as well. So what we do is we register the result of this export task. And within the, um, within the JSON of that result is this export history ID that Catello saves. And uh, it gives you the ID for that. It, it contains all of the metadata that uh, the hammer would write in that JSON file. So what we do is we use, a, um, we use another module that we're providing. This, we're actually adding four modules, the three export and then this cont content export info module. We use content export info with the ID that it gave us in the previous step. And then we get all of the metadata uh, for that export. We then register that result. And now what we can do is use the Ansible built-in copy module. Uh, and this actually writes the file to the disk. Uh, in this case, we're not actually we're not actually copying a file. We're just taking that metadata that we got in a previous step. Uh, but you can use it for that. And uh, here I specify the destination 
uh, directory. You can actually put it anywhere. If you want to get a little more fancy and you know the, uh, the location that Pulp put the export data, you can put the metadata file right there. Uh, but you also have to have file permissions, which I don't for, uh, for this demo. So I'll just show you what it looks like um, when I run it. And it's, it's pretty quick. Uh, right now, I only have one repository in this uh, library, so. So uh, yeah, it's uh, quick and easy. And then now we can see that we now have a metadata.json file. And that contains all of our export data, just like you would have with Hammer. So that was exporting the library. Uh, the version and repository export are very much the same. They just have a few small differences. Uh, with the version, uh, we've added a little bit of convenience for you. So whereas the API makes you pass in a database ID for what content view version you want to export, uh, instead with form and Ansible modules, you can just pass the content view name and then just the, the version string, and it will figure out uh, what it needs to figure out for you. And then finally, with uh, repository export, uh, this destination server and fail on missing content options do not exist. They're not relevant. Um, and then you provide a product and a repository to export. Other than that, everything's pretty much the same. And uh, all of this, all of these tricks with the uh, copy module are in the documentation and examples, uh, so you don't have to remember them. But uh, yeah, that is content exports with Form and Ansible modules. Uh, we do have imports are coming next. Imports are not available yet, but they're, uh, they're coming next, as well as syncable export and import. Uh, we plan to add that eventually as well. So uh, that's it for me. Let's see if there are any questions. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. And we'll wait a few seconds to see if, if there are any questions. OK, so let's move on. Next up is Ian with Catello. No problem. Just yeah. one second. Uh, is the YouTube broadcasting now? No, it wasn't no, working still, before. No. Still, no still not. Um, no. Well, I we have this recorded. Yeah, so we have this recorded, so we can add Jeremy later. And do you want to try to broadcast again? If not, uh, as Nafal said at the beginning, uh, this is all recorded. So if it doesn't work live, we'll just add all of it later to YouTube. If some of this works live, then we'll edit and add those of you that have already presented. Yeah. Um, OK, I think we can move on. Um, again, uh, with Ian, with Catello API Docs, a removal of listed content types. So whenever you're ready, Ian. All right, thanks. I'll just get my screen shared. OK. Um, so I just have a small update here with a Catello API that I wanted to mention, because it might cause things to look a bit different for API users. Um, so just for some history, a while back, um, Catello under the hood changed how it detects what repository types are enabled, types like yum, file, whatever. It used to be that you would define them in a config file, and Catello would trust that. But nowadays, Catello detects what's installed on your system, so you don't even have to think about configuring them. If you want to disable something, you just uh, uninstall or well, use the installer to disable a, uh, a certain content type, which under the hood is just uninstalling a pulp plugin. Um, now, this caused an issue in the API documentation 
um, because the API docs are generated um, without a running without any knowledge of what's running on your foreman. Um, and so that means that all of the types that show up for certain APIs, like on this is the repositories API for creating a repo. Uh, if you see the content types here, you might see, you would see all the types, um, including types that don't exist on your system, um, which is a bit misleading. So we've made a small change here. And that change is instead of showing the types in the API documentation, um, we just have an endpoint listed that you can hit to actually find the, uh, the, the content types. And this includes repository types as well as content unit types as well. Um, and if you try to create a type that isn't available, you should see an error saying that, uh, or which tells you which types are available. Um, but this also has a bit of a change in Hammer, which I'll show you. We've created a new um, Hammer command to support this Catello API that's been around for a while. So the Hammer command here is just Hammer repository types. If you hit that, you'll see all the types and all of the content unit types that go with them as well. So let me pick one here. Let's see. Here's OK, so here's yum. And then you can see listed are all those content types, RPM, module MD, erratum, all that good stuff. And then you have a bit of information about them. So whether it's generic or not, um, this is more, more handy for developers, but that'll tell you if it's using our generic framework for more simple content types like Python um, or OS tree. Um, it'll tell you if it's removable, so if you can remove it from a repo, if you can upload it to a repo, and also if it's even indexed in the Catello database. Some of these content types aren't indexed at all, like distributions or uh, yum repo metadata files, for example. So anyway, it's a small change. It shouldn't break anyone. But if you don't see those content types anymore in the API docs, this is why. Um, and yeah, that's it. OK, great. Thank you, Ian. Uh, again, we'll wait a few seconds. OK, I don't see any questions. I'm pretty sure we can move on to our next topic. So let's see. Next up is a custom CDN configuration type. Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. This is part Great. of the, yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. Just, just tell me if that looks okay. Also, just. Okay. Are you able to see my browser? Okay. Yeah, it looks good. If you can zoom in a little bit. And it will be great. Yeah. Excellent. With this terminal also. Let me yeah. Know. Awesome. All right. Let me. I had two topics for today. One was uh, syncable imports, which is going to come next. Uh, but I feel that's a better start uh, for what we're trying to achieve here. And then we can go back to this, uh, go back to the custom CDN type we added. Uh, okay. Here's the situation. So I, I, Jeremy just presented how we do exports. Uh, but what there's a new kind in, I think, I think I demoed 112 or 113. We introduced this concept of a syncable export. So here's an idea. So yeah, I, I'm in a, I'm in an organization. I come in, look, I let, I'm going to check what's there. Uh, I have the Ansible engine and, and the custom co custom product. And there are like a bunch of custom repositories there. I have an an I have the Red Hat Ansible engine RPMs uh, repository. I also have a content view here. So let me go to content views. Okay. 
Okay. So, let's see. Well, let me see the repos that are there in this. I'm taking okay. So I have I have a yum repo, a file repo, and an Ansible repo. Now, you just I'll just run the simple export just to for completeness. Like so, if I do hammer content export complete version. Help. Please ignore this because I'm just going to develop an environment. So uh, you want you won't see all these warnings. Uh, but that that being said, you see this new thing called format, where you say you can choose syncable or importable. Okay. Now let let's start with. You know, marking the syncable. So let me find the version ID here, the version ID of version 1.0. And I, I don't think you can see it, but it's version 46. Is ID is 46. Okay. Okay. Format, syncable. So what it does, so if I let me cd into this directory, I'll make a note of this directory somewhere. And then look at see cd. So I have as you notice, there's a content, there's a content directory and a custom directory. If I did Find dot. There's like these things called listing files. Uh, these are what the Red Hat CDN kind of exports. The, it's the format, the listing files, kind of these listing files tell it like what what options or what directory options are available, so that you can enable and disable accordingly. They are really relevant only for they are only relevant for Red Hat repositories. Uh, not for custom. And custom also has a structure there. So, like now, okay. Custom also has a structure there. So, I have some packages there. I have some file repos here. They're all exported. Now, I want, if I want to import this content, so the idea is I, I take this directory, I take this directory. And ship it to wherever I need, ship it to whatever uh, Foreman installation or satellite installation where I, I want I want this content to be imported. Uh, so I'd probably so I would have to manually zip it and do it, but for the demo purposes, I'm going to assume that this is the import location also, just for the demo things. So Here's it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to import that, import that version into a okay, sorry. Into this organization. And this has no content views. It has no products enabled, nothing like that. It has but it has a manifest imported in it. So it has it has a bunch of subscriptions available. So, so the idea is what the importer will do is when I try to import this, it will first create the content view. Yeah. It will then create the repository. It will first try to create the Red Hat repository. If it's in a Red Hat repository, it will try to enable. It will try to create a custom repository. And then it tries to create a content view uh, with, with these two things. with the, with those imported and publishes it. So, and but there is this. So this is the regular importer. But with a syncable import, something interesting happens. So we first enable the Red Hat repositories like we do regular. We then enable. We then or we create custom repositories if needed. 
we then point it to this file directory, this path, run a sync operation on it so that the repositories have the latest content. It's just like a regular sync. It's as if you you change the URL to file colon colon slash slash and it will sync from there. Uh, it then adds it to a content view and publishes that content view. So it's kind of doing something very similar to what you would do if you did not have the importer available. It's just that it's making a lot of these operations more con convenient. So let's 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 try. It. Uh, so if I said camera content import and version with the content version we are importing. So I said dash dash organization equals import. Oh, I forgot to give it a path, of course. Okay. So while, yeah, while this is running, I'll just See what has happened here. Like I just want to show you. If I click on products, okay. see how it created these repositories. It created these repositories. Now, if I click on Red Hat Ansible or something like that. Note how the feed URL is file colon colon slash slash. So it's it's basically syncing from here. The idea is the importable environment. That Cannot access the CD directly, and hence needs to use this, uh, use the local path you gave it. Also, it's actually so so it's it syncs and it should be reasonably quicker because it's syncing from local host, from the local uh, file system. I think. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the assumptions is pulp is. Oh, Actually, yeah, one of the assumptions is Pulp is able to access this directory wherever you put the import. So you would be copying the wireless Pulp imports reality. Uh, I kind of cheated a little by me marking this also as an importable repository, but in reality, you would copy it to wireless Pulp exports, then run, run this and it will import, sorry, wireless Pulp imports, and then run the import command as I've shown here. Okay, so. And and it would sync here. Now let me we could the content views. So the operation has com has completed. So let's see what the content view story is. So they got created version one oh as as designed. Has three files, eighty three packages, thirty errata. Uh if I don't remember how many I had there. This is the same, but yeah, there you go. So it's it has pretty much replicated and imported it. Uh, now, it's, it's, so I'll also just quickly run run over the dyn flow action for this, just for completeness sake. Right? Yeah, I do stuff, I do schedule, it's ending. Okay. This one, yeah. If you look at the panel, as I said, it'll, it'll try to create products, custom repositories. It'll also try to enable Enable Red Hat repositories into here. Oh yeah, there you go. Auto create Red Hat repositories. Parta, sorry for interrupting you. Can you zoom in a little bit? Oh okay, sure. Is that better? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Okay, sure. 
So it creates Red Hat repositories. It enables it. And then it runs. This bulk action is actually a sync operation. It just runs repository sync for all the repositories it created or enabled or updated, for that matter. And then it, it tries to update the content view. Then it does a magic publish. Uh, publish and promote. That's that's pretty. That's, that's pretty much well. All it, that's pretty much most of the operations. Uh, it's it's fairly involved because it's doing. It's you making use of multiple operations that we already have. So, so we didn't. So we didn't have to re-implement any of this. We just had to say, hey, sync, hey, publish, and then the the current publish and sync operations are good enough to do all that. Uh, okay. So this is pretty much what I had with respect to syncable imports. Now I have now I want to present this new thing we created called a custom CDN configuration. Okay, let's uh, actually before I jump in there, uh, does anyone have questions on syncable imports? Yes, thank you. Maybe we will wait a couple of seconds to see if anyone has questions. You know, I'll, I'll set up my environment for the blur. So if I did hammer organization, it's fine. Import me on me. Sorry. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, I'll I'll just continue with my CDN configuration part. Uh, so I'm just I'm just resetting my environment. So I just I just destroying the organization, creating it and importing a new manifest basically. Well, well, that is happening. Uh, let me show you. Actually, okay, let's wait for it. It seems like it's fairly, it's reasonably fast. Uh, So if I went to default organization, reload this page. Okay. Oh, it's still there, or is it it's still there? Uh, while he's getting deleted. So here's my end goal now. So you remember how I was exporting a content view from default organization? Now, in some cases, the customer just wants you know, he just, he doesn't want to use the import. The customer wants to manually be able to sync it. Uh, so, in operation complete that here. So the idea is I have a I have these I have this content. Uh, I have these set of repositories and content, and I want to be able to like import. On my own, so I don't. I, I don't want to use the importer. Uh, I want to. I want to be able to just directly import uh, specific stuff that I want. Or enable and import. So as you, as I showed you, this was like this was like a CV and dump, right? Just I did find dot. Should there was a listing files and all that. Uh, let me recheck this. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll. I'll I'll try something interesting. So uh, first, I'll create the org that I just deleted uh, before I continue. Yeah. 
Okay, now let me reset this. So I'll, I'll start a web server here. Simple. Let me make sure I don't have. Uh, okay, give it a number and on number four thousand. Okay, so it's running on port four thousand. If I if I go to this box, four thousand, four thousand. If I did, you can. So it's just serving the content. The idea is, idea is, the user has copied. The extract the, the whatever we exported, the user has copied it to an Apache web server somewhere that is accessible to the importing satellite or importing from an instance. Uh, so he is, so it is in a web server. So like the idea is they they put it in a single at a single web server location, and multiple importing satellites can make use of this stash or or this content dump for their work. So that's the reason I, I started a web server here, just to just in, instead of putting it in a patch, I just I wanted to do it. I wanted to do a quick demo uh, for demo purposes. Uh, okay, let me let's now go my then I created a new org uh, that worked. Okay, I might need to reload this page and select the read because I. I deleted it and re-added it. Yeah, there you go. See, now I you see what I have in my subscriptions. I have a oh, I have to import a manifest. Let me do that. Well, well, the manifest import operations is happening. Let me see if I can still do it. Okay, good. Okay, finished importing. Now you see the section called CDN configuration. You click on the tab, you see that right now it's configured. Red Hat consumed will, right now it's configured to pull things from the CDN. But I want, I want it to pull from my, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in a disconnected foreman or satellite setup. So I want to be able to use my web server. Uh, I only use the contact from my web server to sync instead of going to the Red Hat CDN. So we now added a new section called custom CDN. So, that, so the idea is you would copy this URL here. Then you update it. So it updates the CDN configuration to custom. Now we also have we also worked on adding a certificate here. So if I if you if it was an HTTPS web server, and you need, and the CA is not trusted by this guy. You can add it here, and it will it will include that. Uh, okay. Close this. Now I'll go to the Red Hat repositories page, and I think I had only Ansible exported. I have, that's the only thing I had. So let's see. So I think I need to make it smaller for me to, oh yeah, there you go. Now, you can see that this has an X86, 8664. And let me see, AppStream. If I clicked on AppStream, for example, that was not there in my stash here. 
the path, the base path was not there in the in the dump that I had. I only had Ansible and Rel Seven, so you don't you will see you will see no report repositories available. But it's kind of smart enough to look there and see what's there and tell you whether it's there or not. Uh, so I'm going to enable this repository. And if I went to products, to make get enabled. Uh, OK, it's not it's still, it's still thinking about it. Okay. Give me one minute. Let's try it. Check this on. If I say one minute last time was the did they need the job run? I just want to check that quickly. Oh, okay. So it's a error. Let me see what was the error. Oh. Okay, uh, sounds like I hit a bug that I need to figure out. Uh, but the idea is you should, you'll be able to enable this and pull in content from there. I'll just show you the, so this works for Red Hat repositories. For custom repositories, I will have to put there. So I'm create I'm creating a new repo. Yeah, this this is still an upstream development, so we are hopefully we will catch most of the bugs before they reach you all. Uh, so if you remember, what was it? Four thousand. So let so you will you will actually manually configure this. So what will happen is so repo. So you have these repo packages directory. So you should, you will be, what you would do is you would configure it here. You'd mark that as the upstream URL. This is like the regular one. Uh, there's something off with the enable. I, I need to check that. But the what what enable will do is something similar. It'll it'll enable the Red Hat repository and mark this as the upstream URL. It will use the lo local web server's upstream URL. And then you can. You will be able to sync anything you want. Uh, if you sync it, it's going to pull it from the local host. So. so as you see, it's happening. Okay, it's trying to figure out some. Uh, okay. You know, I think I had the wrong answer both here. That's the reason it gave me that error. Okay, let me try that. Let me one more try. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I think I think my guy had real seven ansible. This one has only eight, so uh yeah, let's see. Just curious. Yeah, that's the problem. I need let me copy this wrong label. If I did label, content label, yes. Yeah, okay. I have to enable this. I had the wrong answer to the demo. So so if I did that, see if I enabled it. Uh, I go to products now. See how it points to a different directory because I think I points to a different directory and pulls it from there. Uh, 
Okay. That's pretty much all I had for today. Uh, any other, any questions? Thank you, Partha. I don't see any questions, but let's wait a couple more seconds. Very good. Such a Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Badra. Okay. Um, and for our last topic on the user focused demos is Oleg uh, with the topic selectable columns on hosts, hosts page. Yep. Thank you, Nofar. I'll just try to show my screen. Okay, then. Um, today I'm going to show you uh, a small feature we have added in Foreman 3.4. And this feature allows you to select columns on the main host index page. Um, it allows you to select columns that you want to see here. Um, currently, this feature is more like technical preview, so it's um, still um, pretty limited, but we are working on that, and in Foreman 3.5, we should uh, we should be uh, able to finish it, and well, the feature will be more useful, but as of now, you can still play with this. Uh, unfortunately, and currently, um, you can select all. Uh, you can select only columns that you uh, see here currently. And this feature, as of now, again uh, allows you to only select uh, only select uh, or reduce the the columns that you currently have. Um, you can do it via Hammer, and it's the command called uh, user table preferences. And you can uh, create a list or um, delete any table preferences you uh, might want to have. And let's... Um, create a new one uh, for for current user and for the um, for this table which is called hosts so no big deal and uh, I'll select just a few columns I want to see on this page for example host name of course um, maybe model and comments. And the preference, the table preference was um, created and the uh, and this page will reflect that after it gets reloaded. So let me just show you. As you can see, the page was modified a bit. Um, there are some limitations regarding uh, power column and recommendations column that just because I have um, some plugins installed and they um, currently don't support the um, selectable feature, but we are working on that as, as well. Um, currently, as you can see, it uh, the feature does not make much sense as of now, but you still can play it with this. Um, our plan is to add more columns into this page, and by default, they will be hidden. And that's why uh, this feature, well, the feature is about um, to, to make users be able to say what what columns I want to see on this page. Since we are going to add some more columns uh, and uh, we don't want to uh, float this page with them, uh, it's up to users um, 
which uh, which columns I want to see here. Uh, in other words, it's this which is somehow replacing uh, one of the plugins called Formal uh, Columns View, which is no longer supported. And uh, I'm afraid it it's broken as of now. Um, so that's it regarding this uh, feature, which is currently present in Formal 3.4. But <clears throat> I also wanted to ask you, uh, for some ideas, uh, we've got uh, we've got some ideas uh, regarding which columns are useful on this page, and we are going to add them. But uh, you, as users, I want to ask um, to visit uh, today's demo agenda and uh, refer to this um, RFC we have here. Um, in this RFC, you could uh, leave your suggestions or questions or anything related to selectable columns on host page. Um, yeah, if yeah, I'm so, not mistaken. But... Yeah, I see that Jeremy asked if uh, plugins can add columns. Uh, sure. Um, since, well, if if you're an um, advanced user and you, you're writing your plugin, of course, you can uh, add your columns. Uh, it's uh, it can be done via pagelets uh, if you used uh, at least once uh, the whole uh, process of adding new columns is the same as with any pagelet. Uh, also, we we have some developer documentation uh, in the in the performance repository so you can um, see there's some some information on how to add some columns and if I'm not mistaken that's that's pretty it. okay thank you I don't see any questions uh, but we'll wait a few seconds. I had one question before that. Do you you assign the name to the table preference when you're creating it in Hammer? Does that have to be the same name as the table name, or was that just coincidence? Uh, it's not a coincidence. Uh, thank you for this this question. And yeah, uh, if you want to um, if you want to create some preferences regarding a table, um, you must uh, know the name of the table. Uh, in this particular case, it's pretty straightforward. It's named hosts and the page called hosts as well. Uh, so uh, no mistakes can be made. Uh, it uh, it works like this in Hammer because initially we wanted to support all the pages, all the tables. But um, since uh, it uh, would require a ton of work, um, we decided to make some ground uh, or base uh, for the new features for the future. But um, currently, we are focused on uh, host page only. And that's why um, so currently, you only uh, will see the changes on the host page. But also, I forgot to mention that uh, this way of adjusting columns via Hammer is temporary. Well, it will be present in the future, but uh, it's the only way as of now. And uh, since it's uh, not so user friendly, I would say we are working on uh, on the UI selector, which will be present as part of the host page. Uh, where users uh, would be able to simply click uh, and check the columns they want to see and apply those changes and all all the preferences will be created or updated automatically and it will be more user friendly so you uh, even uh, wouldn't need to know the uh, name of the table because it will be done automatically 
But as of now, since, a since this feature is a technical preview, you would uh, need to use Hammer to, uh, to select some columns. Hey, okay, great. Thanks again, Olaf. I think we can move on. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Also on the community.deforman.org. Okay, so moving on to our last topic, which is a developer-focused demo, uh, which is also mine. So I will present it. And uh, the topic is uh, adding a disable option to the drop-down menu items on Foreman. So let me share, share my screen. Okay, that's interesting to host the demo and share you something. <laughs> so just a second. We'll make sure that everything uh, is displayed correctly. Okay. So let's start until the page will refresh itself. Um, this is the PR for adding a disable option to links in the drop down menus. And basically, a big change is um, implemented here in the dev action buttons uh, in the application helper.rb uh, file. And as you can see here, uh, here we have a, a hash that we check if the action was sent inside a hash. And if it does, uh, we're adding here the Li tag, uh, a class, which will make the button disabled. Okay, let's see it in action. It will be easier to understand. And then I will show you an example in Ansible of how it was in implemented from a plugin, even though you can implement, implement it uh, anywhere in the code you want, as long as your method is calling the action items. Yeah, this one, the action buttons, sorry. It's taking a lot of time, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I guess I can show you un until uh, the page, yeah, I think the page is ready, yeah. Great, so here you can see for the no roles uh, host group that here this option for the run all Ansible roles is disabled. I mean, you can click it and uh, it's displayed differently. Uh, and that is because there are no roles assigned to this uh, particular host group and the way it, uh, I implemented it, it's here from the um, Ansible, form an Ansible plugin. And you can see that the first action is sent inside a hash um, and the second one is not. So you can see the difference between them. And inside that hash, you can see here that you have the options um, uh, tag uh, with the class disabled. And um, in case it's not clear enough, uh, there's also the documentation for how to create a plugin uh, on the Foreman repository. And here we explain how to extend the host group UI. And here uh, for the plugin, you can see uh, we have two examples. The first one is the regular example for a regular action item. And the second one, is as you can see inside a hash, uh, as I displayed earlier with the option tag and the class disabled uh, field uh, to add to, to the HTML uh, property. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, I see that there are no questions. So 
think we can say goodbye right now. And thank you uh, for joining us. And again, please feel free to talk to us in the uh, Libra chat or in the community.theforman.org. And see you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.